Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Sarah Doss said, my name is Adolfo Jimenez. I'm chair of the Miami International Arbitration Society. Uh, this is a membership meeting. Before we get uh, started, I just wanted to remind everybody we used to meet every so often at around this time. So we're slowly, I think, going back to tradition, trying to go back to how things were. Um, uh, surprisingly, we've been able to maintain a pretty robust schedule with a fair amount of programming. Uh, my predecessor, Luis Onaten, did a very good job of pushing us to, to go virtual, go with uh, uh, the internet. And it's, it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish through our website. I'm gonna urge all of you, if you haven't done so already, to please put in your member profiles at our uh, web address, mias.org. If you haven't seen the website, it's uh, very, very robust, and we're hoping to maximize its use. So please um, go in there and uh, update your profile. Um, we've had a few programs this year already. Um, if you uh, weren't able to see them, they're, they're on our website. Uh, we had a program with Claudia Solomon, the incoming president of the ICC. That was very, very interesting. It was a conversation where she really talked about her perspective and how things, how she saw things that are relevant to international arbitration. Together with the uh, University of Miami Law School, uh, we had a program with the Japan Arbitration Center. Uh, I hope you were able to catch it. It was extremely interesting, a good example of sharing information uh, across borders and obviously on the other side of the world. So very, very interesting programs. We have a lot coming up um, uh, in the near future, which um, including a program on May 27th with Desti Garraga, who's going to be the, uh, joining us together with the director of the London Court of International Arbitration. Um, again, that's on May 27th, so I hope you can join us for that. Um, let me introduce our guest, who's really not a guest, but a longtime member and a founder of Miami International Arbitration Society, Jose Esti Garraga. He really needs no introduction. He is, um, I'll call him the Dean of International Arbitration, at least in Miami, but it really goes beyond that. He's the Global Arbitration Practice Group Head for Reed Smith. He's been uh, extremely uh, active. Just before this meeting, we were talking about how life has changed in the last year, um, but yet you, we've been able to, to keep it going. And I think international arbitration in particular has been um, important. Uh, Jose has a long, long history in the international arbitration world. He's world renowned. He's done so much with different organizations, whether it's the ICC, um, the London Court of International Arbitration. He's worked in a, a host of different um, types of matters, but it's, it's really great to have him here, have him as a member, have him as an um, important person within the international arbitration world. Um, Jose is here for, for one reason, and we're very happy to have it because it's, it's uh, a program that he's been uh, providing to a lot of different areas. And, um, you know, he, we we're very happy he's able to present it to Miami. Jose is co-head of a task force that the ICC put together that they put out a report called the Accuracy of Fact Witness Memory in International Arbitration. Um, it really is a, a study uh, on the art and science of testimony and witness testimony. Um, it, uh, when, when you look at um, you know, what we do as advocates, you oftentimes wonder, is this an art or a science? And I think this is gonna be a interesting discussion as to where does it fall? I don't wanna take away, Jose, take it away. Well, Adolfo, thank you very, very much, and, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, truly, you you know you read it exactly as my mother wrote it. Um, so, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, let's see, uh, Sarah. So I, I'll get to share my screen. Can I do that? Yes, you can. Perfect. One second. Okay, can you, can you see my screen, Adolfo? Yes, yes, it comes Well, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. Um, 
and, and, uh, and I'll get right to it. I we had a very interesting discussion with Adolfo uh, in, in advance of uh, the presentation this morning. And one of the things that I uh, found particularly interesting in this, uh, in, in this work is that, you know, so much of, of the work that we do in international arbitration will focus on, uh, you know, what does uh, uh, Rule 12a, you know, provide with respect to this or that. Um, and uh, yet this uh, task force that the ICC appointed uh, deals with, I think, an, uh, also a very, very important part of what we do in international arbitration, which is not about rules or anything else, but it's about the human factor uh, and the human element in the uh, qualitative output of the decision-making process. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, everyone on this phone, uh, on this call uh, conference uh, has an interest in international arbitration, otherwise they wouldn't be here. So we all have a, a, an investment, if you would, on international arbitration as a dispute resolution method. And the reality then is that that output that, uh, of international arbitration as a, as a dispute resolution method is affected by any number of things, including the rules and so on, but there's also the human factor. And what over time in, in recent years, uh, you know, perhaps you've read about and heard about you know, cognitive bias and cultural issues and things like that that affect the qualitative output of the process that we all you know, take part in. Well, one aspect of that was the, the, the reality of, of human memory. Uh, and that is uh, that uh, in, in recent years, uh, psychological experiments and, and studies and so on have uh, identified that the human memory is uh, not perfect. We all know that, but that perhaps it's a lot less reliable than uh, we, we thought even while acknowledging uh, that uh, human memory is not perfect. And I thought it was, uh, it, it sort of caught my attention. This is uh, a you know, if you've read uh, Proust's uh, work, um, move this uh, here. Um, he, in you know, he 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 wrote. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, he wrote. You know, remembrance of things past is not necessarily the remembrance of things as they were, and there's so much truth to that. Uh, and uh, as I go through the the presentation, you'll you'll see why uh, why I chose that. Now. It, it turns out that there are, and there are going to be two aspects to this presentation this morning. Um, and the, there's one aspect which will be the task force report and what they found and so on. Uh, but the part that, in a way, is even more interesting and fascinating to me is what I'll tell you on the back half of the report, which is the um, the, the way it crystallizes the challenge that I, as co-chair of the task force, uh, faced in trying to put forward the, what ultimately is the report, because what you'll discover is that the, the, the task force was, was global. Uh, there were arbitrators, lawyers, and so on from across the globe. And lo and behold, as you're trying to come up with something of a consensus, you will see sort of the very different views that uh, arbitrators and lawyers and participants in the process have as to the process, have as to witness evidence, and so on. So, but let me start with the, the task force report itself. So uh, what laid the groundwork for this task force is that uh, you know, scientific studies uh, and human experience have, have shown, and don't worry about the, 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 the slides, and I apologize, I am gonna say this to you. I'm not gonna share the presentation for reasons that you'll see as I get all, all along the way. So you're welcome to listen and, and so on, but, but I don't wind up sharing the slides. And one of the reasons for that is that there is going to be a fuller launch of all this by the ICC and, and I think that would be the appropriate, you know, place and time. Um, but, and, and this is most, mostly just a guide, there'll be some quotes that might be of interest to you, but in any event, the, we, as I said, we, we all know human memory is not perfect. Um, the other part, though, is that human memory is malleable, and I'll talk to you about some of the scientific studies that have, you know, really drive that home. And the third aspect that is sort of a conclusion was not, not as much the basis of the, um, uh, the task force, but basically it was a concern that led to the task force is whether practices in modern arbitration, what, what we do on a daily basis in the, the dry arbitral process, is that somehow contributing or making the vulnerability of the memory even worse? In other words, again, are we affecting the qualitative output of the arbitral process by things that we are doing because we're, we're somehow distorting or affecting evidence? Um, 
So the structure of the report was uh, it essentially set up in, in, in five, ultimately six sections. And then the, the part of it was, you know, what existing scientific research uh, tells us about memory and eyewitness evidence. And you'll, there's a chapter in, in the, the task force report about that. Um, number two, do the same witness memory issues arise in international arbitration? Uh, number three, um, okay, what are the, those issues and how are they significant in international arbitration? How significant are they? Number four, what measures can be taken to improve the accuracy of witness memory, again, to help better the, the process of arbitration, and finally, some conclusions and recommendations. It, just to, to pause on these for a moment, so what, when one of the things that we first faced when the, uh, we started this task force was that some of the folks on the task force, and we found that, you know, some skepticism. Let me, let, me, let me close this so that the sun won't be casting shadows here. One of the things that um, we found was some degree of skepticism in, in folks saying, look, a lot of the scientific and psychological studies that have been done relate to what you call a flashbulb memory, right? So somebody sees a traffic accident, boom, it's burned in their mind and so on. And that memory and, and testing that memory, which you develop in, at times in, in just seconds or, or, or even less, um, is one thing. It's another thing in international arbitration where say if you're dealing with a construction project and the engineers have been dealing with it for three years, that's a different type of memory. So really the, some of the, the skeptics would say, you know, you're not really gonna convince me that these are the same things. And so one things that we undertook was we actually uh, appointed uh, and, and fortunately were able to count on the expertise of uh, leading psychologists such as Kimberly Wade, we actually conducted psychological field studies to see if in fact they applied. Um, and, uh, and ultimately we, we found that, that they did. There was a hypothetical case that was given to um, designed and it, they, we built into that and I will go over some of these, some of the elements that you could test whether in the context of a uh, arbitral dispute, typical arbitral dispute, you, the same concerns were, were present. It involved essentially a, the, the, the purchase of a flooring for a factory and the fact that it cracked and some machines that were being rolled on the floor and so on. And you asked either participants to say, assume this role, that you're the manager of the factory or assume you're the manager of the, the, the floor or flooring company and you know, tell us your perspective and what do you remember? And it, it turned out that they in fact were vulnerable to some of the same issues. So um, the, in terms of the scientific research, the, the appendix to the report, uh, you know, it, the entire report I think is interesting and, and worth reading. Obviously I, I'm a bit biased, but the fact is that the, the, there's one aspect that if nothing else, I think would be particularly interesting to you. And that is the appendix, which then sets forth the body of scientific research and so on that was done. The report itself contains some summaries, but just to give you an example, I'll focus on three areas in particular, and that is how the specific wording of a question can change the way in which a witness will reply to a question. The second one is what's called post effect of post event information, um, including you know, situations where distortions are introduced to the witness's own memory reports. Um, misinformation that, that arises from witnesses speaking to each other. In other words, in effect, they contaminate, and I'll give you some examples here. And the creation, and so this is part that was particularly uh, impacting to me, is that you can create, and it's been shown, you can create entirely false memories. You can implant false memories uh, into a person who genuinely believes it. I, I will say one thing, and that, that is that as we, we go forward in, in the report, this report does not deal with lying witnesses. In other words, we're not dealing with situations where we're trying to deal with the testimony of somebody who's deliberately trying to deceive. This is where somebody genuinely in good faith is telling you what they believe. However, their memory is failing because of, because of X and Y reason, including at times some of the things that we as lawyers do. Um, and the third aspect was the, how the act of retelling uh, the story from a particular perspective can change a witness's memory. So we'll go through some of these real quick. In terms of the specific wording, uh, for example, the studies will show you that participants in a study who were asked to recall, did you see the broken headlight? 
uh, were far more likely to recall a broken headlight than participants to, who were simply asked, did you see a broken headlight? Again, in these instances, you know, people are shown scenes of a traffic accident, and whatnot, and then after a while they're asked, you know, what do you remember? Well, again, from the standpoint of cross-examination, direct examination, questions by the arbitrators, um, you know, even an arbitrary, because you can say the advocates, well, of course, the advocates are going to try to manipulate the language and everything else to get the answer they want. But even as an arbitrator, and part of the report talks about our arbitrators can do, think about as an arbitrator, how the wording, how you word your question can affect the result without intending it. Obviously, an arbitrator, you know, typically does not have an agenda, typically is looking for you know, the, the, the truth, the best answer, and just think about you know, how this could impact the answer, uh, you know, un unintentionally. Um, and indeed, one of the things that the task force report does says that, you know, the entire community and, and especially arbitrators, you know, need to be sensitized to some of the issues. I'll give you another example. Um, I mean, participants have been shown a video clip where there's uh, no school was present at, at all. Again, you know, they're, they're shown a, a, a series of things and then the memory is ultimately tested. And what I call the indirect wording. So if they asked him, did you see the school bus? Um, you know, there was a certain level of, of answers of no. The levels of yes increased when you said, did you see the children get on the school bus? Again, it's sort of the indirect wording. And through this indirect wording, you wound up with people uh, again saying yes, when in fact there had, there had not been a school bus. Um, the, you know, another example can be the uh, qualifying descriptors. Uh, multiple examples I could give you this, but a real easy one is participants in one study were shown um, they, they were at, was shown a movie and it says, you know, how long was the movie? And the answer was an average of 130 minutes. Um, and the people who were asked, well, how short was the movie? They responded 100 minutes. And, you know, consistently that sort of example I, I, I could give you and others where, you know, how fast was the car going when they crashed into each other? How slow were the cars coming in, were going uh, when they bumped into each other? And they saw the same thing. But yet, you know, they had a different perception of it when, when asked in, in the different ways. Um, I'll skip this one. This is another example where, where you know, how, how frequently do you have uh, headaches or, you know, how is it occasionally? And you'll see the different numbers. But just to, to keep going, the second thing I, I, I mentioned was the wit, what I call witness contamination. Um, and that is that when two subjects have, you know, seen uh, a, an event, However, it was perceived from different perspectives. Um, now, so it was very similar, um, but they were from, from different camera angles. And so as to some things, they each saw different things, right? They then had an opportunity to talk about it. And then they were later asked about their recollections. And what you found is that they you know, each remembered, remembered in quotes, things that in fact they had not seen from their vantage point. Again, it's the, the aspect of, of witness contamination. Now, why is this, this pertinent? I can, again, you know, they just think about either your cases that, that the advocates might be involved in. You know, there's some catastrophe, there's some plant explosion, there's some problem with a construction or, you know, uh, you know with a deal or whatever it might be. Um, you know, very often the witness interviews are conducted in, in a group, right? Uh, so I've had cases, you know, uh, say a construction case where there's been a problem on the construction, you should bring in the engineering team and they're all sitting around the table trying to diagnose what has had and, you know, in, in the witness interview. And that uh, can wind up in effect then contaminating. And one of the the, I will tell you, the, the report was very careful not to make recommendations uh, in, in the sense of these are best practices. The report more set forth a series of tools. Notice these, this is a toolkit of things that you can apply when appropriate. And one of the things is, hey, think about whether in those situations it, you, are, you can, whether it's feasible, for example, to conduct your witness interviews individually and get from each person their recollection before they wind up contaminating each other. I think I, I have had those in one case in, in particular, particularly acute case where the lead engineer who was the boss of the team, in effect, had a just a dominant personality. And in the course of trying to do this collectively uh, at the time, you know, a, one of the engineers would say such and such. And the, they would say, no, 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 let me tell you what actually happened. 
And the point was that, you know, sure, the engineer who was first speaking up and said, well, I'm going to stick to my guns. And when I talk to, you know, a sticker, I'm going to tell him what in fact it was. But what happens is the memory then not being a, you know, file that you go into the brain and you retrieve static winds up getting, in effect, contaminated and, and affected. Um, so this idea is one particularly to, to me in, in the course of my work that I have, you know, been paying some particular attention to. Um, the, the, the other one that I think is very interesting for, for all of us, given that you know, we're involved in commercial disputes, is the notion of what's called the bias, pers uh, the bias, the, the bias perspective retail, uh, uh, retelling. Um, and there have been, uh, in effect, it, it, the, the, the point of this is that uh, research has shown that when you take a particular perspective after a, an event is, is taken in your memory, you, you recall the event through your perspective, right? And so the experiments that have been um, run on this, again, they're in the task force. You know, you, you, you say you have a, a set, say someone write out, you know, your roommate and it writes something in effect complaining about your roommate to the administration, right? Um, and then you have a control group that's not just write about your roommate. Well. You, what you discover is that when they're asked to do it through a particular perspective, that winds up, in fact, a creating you know deeper memory. Uh, it, it it winds up creating biased perspective and and so on. Um, so how is that relevant to us in arbitration? We'll think about, of course, that an employee uh, or a manager, in fact, has a biased perspective, even if they are, you know, honest great integrity and have, you know, the best of intention, they nevertheless are still looking at the world from their perspective. Um, and that can wind up affecting their uh, memory. Um, so that's the, the, the story. We'll skip that one. Okay. And then the false memories um, uh, here, the, 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 this is the one where I was telling you that, you know, and memories can get implanted. So participants who were reminded of true events from their childhood were, again, it's not now, you know, it gets implanted at 810 and then at, you know, 820, they're, they're all of a sudden, oh, I've had this memory. Um, but by the inclusion of later questions, and so, for example, in one case, it was getting lost in a mall. As a child, you know, this person was led to believe that they were lost in a mall. They will recall these events. By the inclusion of these questions, um, they later genuinely believed that 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 was the case. Um, and, and here's an example of, um, of one. So on the left, you have the genuine photo, okay, uh, of which it was obtained from the from this subject's family. Um, and then that the Dr. Wade, uh, in effect, manufactured this photo, and you can see him put it in a hot air balloon. And what her research and test results, uh, in effect, demonstrated is that they were able to say to us, oh, yes, you remember, I remember that hot air balloon, and so on. Um, and even though, of course, it's, it was not, uh, that was not, in fact, the case. Um, the uh, one key takeaway, given that, you know, all of us on, on the phone, again, have an interest in international arbitration, um, is the idea that culture did not keep a witness from incorporating details of other memories. In other words, what I'm getting at is this is not something that is particular to a culture. It's particular basically to human memory. And in the uh, report, you will see that there is a study that included, you know, subjects uh, from Brazil and, and from other countries where these idea of, in the, in the particular one, it was witness con contamination. Again, they were vulnerable to it as well. Uh, so, to the extent that you know one of us might or any of us might feel, well, you know, there, there's some, you know, cultures where where this doesn't occur, that does not seem to be borne out. Um, well, so, can I just, just please, can just for a second, I just want to follow up on. No, this is very important. Going back be to great. <laughs> on that aspect of international arbitration. I find that there's a the, the value that um, different practitioners have on live testimony tends to vary sometimes between countries, between cultures. Um, I had one co-arbitrator once tell me, um, 
I don't really value uh, live testimony. The assumption where I come from is that everybody lies. Um, I, what you've just gone through is, are a lot of examples where even if you're not trying to deceive, sometimes people just view it differently because of their bias or the way questions are asked and all these other things. I'm curious as to when the, the task force was looking at this, was, you know, you, did you look at memory and, and the value that it has and, and how that evidence was going to be received by different cultures? And, and how did you uh, weigh that into, into your analysis and report? Uh, Adolfo, as always, uh, and Adolfo and I have, uh, you know, uh, practice and, and I say, you know, even, even on, on the, across the table, and as always, Adolfo is ahead of me. Uh, and uh, Adolfo, you will see that that's the back half of the report. That's the part that I, as I said, to me was particularly a challenging and interesting. So if I may, I'll, I'll park that for the moment. That work okay? So you just proved that we did not, did not rehearse this. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Uh, but it's it's right on the money, and and to me that's really really interesting um, aspect of, of of the work. So uh, Dr. Wade's research reveals uh, the memory of witnesses in international arbitration is subject to the same distorting effects. Uh, as I said, when we the, the things that I've just gone through were things that we reported to the, to the, to the task force, uh, and we had task force members say, "Well, but you know, is that really you know international arbitration?" And so, in fact, we commissioned uh, this study that I, I already mentioned to you, um, you know, we, we wound up doing. And so we did get, and that's in the task force report. So you can read about it and you will see that, in fact, it, it does very much apply. Um, the other thing that we uh, addressed was uh, that, you know, some folks, uh, you know, were saying, well, you know, OK. Uh, I'm sorry, some folks. Uh, picked up on, uh, you know, Adolfo's point saying, no, witness evidence, this just shows why witness evidence, you know, is not um, reliable and so on. And, you know, one of the things that we said, well, wait, look, uh, because certainly there are elements of witness evidence where memory is very, very important, but there's witness evidence that is used for lots of other things and there that aren't affected by, by witness memory. Um, and so, you know, some of the examples that we gave is that, you know, witness evidence can be done, for example, um, yes, for proving disputed facts. Um, and in that instance, of course, memory uh, is important because if witness A has a better memory, more accurate memory than witness B, then, of course, you'll tend to rely more and place more trust on, on the evidence of witness A. Uh, that's true. But there are Witness testimony can be important, for example, for explaining documents, and that's not necessarily reliant on memory. You know, they're, they're trying to put something in context. Um, providing background, in effect, telling the story, uh, the context of the story is one of the things that you'll, you'll hear talk about in here in a few minutes. Or providing technical explanations. Again, in those instances, this is not a, a point of witness um, memory. Um, and so that was one of the important points that I think the task force brought up to, you know, particularly the folks who were skeptical, saying, well, wait, there's, there's other value to witness evidence. Um, now, so we, we, we established, A, the scientific basis, the fact that there is issues with witness memory, that they, they in fact occurred in international arbitration, um, as well that uh, witness evidence is used in international arbitration, and as to some of those, witness memory is very impo important. Um, and so the task force then said about, okay, well, what, what are some of the things that we can do uh, to protect against this? And um, again, for purposes of this report, we wouldn't have time to cover what I would say is the second half, and to me, uh, you know, very, very important part. Um, I won't go through all of the recommendations or, again, tools, not recommendations that were uh, made by the task force, but they're in the report. And I think they, they're a quick read and they are worth reading. But uh, the, 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 the umbrella of it was, look, there are many steps that can be taken by witnesses, by in-house counsel, outside counsel, arbitral tribunals to reduce the risk of distorting witness memory uh, and to better assess the weight to be given to witness evidence. And so just real quickly, you know, in-house counsel, really they're the first responders, if you think about it. They're the first ones on the scene when a dispute has arisen um, and, and so on. And one of the things that they, they in particular can think about is when they're interviewing their clients, well, again, if you do it in a group, you're running some risk. If it's necessary, you have no choice, but think about whether or not you do those interviews in isolation. 
Um, the other thing is that in-house counsel can do is encourage you know, early recordation of memory. In other words, when something is fresh, listen, write, write me a memo right now telling me what happened while it's fresh in your mind, as opposed to six months later where there's been contamination. Again, I'll go through these real quickly. Outside counsel of uh, you know, parties uh, representing, you know, presenting witnesses, again, sort of the same thing. The first interview of witnesses, well, uh, A, think about the, the individual versus collective interviews, but as well, think about how your phrasing of your questions, again, unintentional, we're, we're not talking about somebody who's deliberately trying to lead a witness to, to give an answer, but unintentionally, think about how you're questioning of, did you see V or did you see A, can wind up giving you what at the end of the day might be a, a false answer or a, or a not true answer um, and how that could affect obviously ultimately your, your defense or prosecution of the case. Um, preparation of witness statements, uh, a huge subject of debate. You know, uh, Some say, listen, these things are written by the lawyers. I don't even rely on them and so on. Um, others saying, you know, the witnesses should be able to should draft the witness uh, statements by themselves uh, and in their own words and so on. Uh, and, you know, other folks are saying, well, look, is, is that really practical? Very often lay persons don't have uh, either the, 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 the ability or even know what's really at issue. And, and that would be a really a not very uh, practical uh, thing to do. Um, th there was, this was a source of a lot of discussion, I, I will tell you. Um, and then in terms of the witness preparation before the hearing, again, I want to get to the, to the back half of this. So I'll, again, it's in the report and, and worth, uh, worth reading. The other thing is that there's, there were recommend, I can apologize, there were tools provided to the arbitral tribunal, guidance to the tribal tri, arbitral tribunal. You know, there was one question raised is, look, should the arbitral tribunal take up at the very beginning uh, issues this at the beginning of the case and provide guidance to the parties as to how the witness statement should be prepared or what are the rules of engagement. You know, there's been talk, of course, or there is talk about in, in some um, uh, jurisdictions in effect about or, or debate about whether you can prepare a witness in advance uh, and, and so on uh, and the degree of preparation. So that was something. The other aspect the tribunal can do is, you know, provide guidance to the witness. So it was this testifying say, look, it's all right to say, don't know, you know, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, third, to educate themselves about, again, things like that, how they ask a question can impact the witness's answer, again, without an intention by the tribunal to guide or direct or steer the witness towards a certain answer. So the, here is knowledge is power. The message from the task force will it's very important that the entire arbitral community, but in particular arbitrators, you know, educate themselves about human memory and how it affects uh, the in evidence that they are relying on to uh, decide their cases. Um, and one of the things that, that we pointed out is, look, some of those steps are going to be impractical, or in fact, in some cases, they could even reduce the accuracy of witness evidence. So you do it on a case-by-case -case basis. You, you've got to be, make it you know, even witness-by-witness -witness, uh, before applying some of these tools. So that really is, is uh, obviously, a, a did not give you all of the recommendations and so on. I hope that I provided to you a teaser of what's in the report and uh, setting aside the fact that, of course, I'm, I'm biased. Um, the, uh, apologize, my phone is off, so I'm not sure why that happened. Um, uh, setting aside from the, the bias, I, I, I will tell you that folks who have read the report have said that you know they, they, they feel that it, it's helped them, and so I would encourage you to do that. Um, I, I, I told you about the, uh, the challenge, in effect, that, that we faced as co-chairs in, in trying to, uh, in effect, arrive at a consensus with respect to uh, the issues. Um, this was a uh, task force from folks uh, across the world. Um, one of the things that we did is just in order to try to, you know, figure out where to start our work is we conducted a survey of the task force. And what it in effect showed to me was uh, really some fundamental conceptual differences with respect to witness evidence. And, you know, Adolfo, you know, just nailed it. it, it, it and that was a perfect example about uh, 
So what I'm going to do real quick is just give you some of the uh, answers that were provided in, in the response to the task force survey that in effect illustrate the sort of competing ideas that again, as co-chairs of the task force, we were trying to figure out, okay, how, how are we possibly going to land at, at, a, at a common ground? Um, and so uh, one of the questions was, um, let me just yeah, apologize, let me see if I can move this here. Um, Yeah, one of the questions was about uh, you know council conduct and testimony and and so on, and um, what what could be done. And one of the recommendations that we had was you know question eight was well we need to train the witness. Well, let me tell you in terms of some of these answers, this is a, a worldwide task force. Uh, English was not the first language for everybody, so you might see some things phrased in a way that that you know might seem uh, you know not. Uh, perfectly done, but but certainly the message is there. So one of the things that one of the recommendations was what can counsel do? Train the witness well, you know, better prepare the witness for testimony, right? That was the first answer, the, the, the top answer. Bottom answer is parties and counsel should abstain from training the witness or from mock ex exercises. So you see right there, just a very easy one about a contrast in views. Let me uh, give you another one. Um, uh, another one, what are the top three suggestions you have for enhancing the probative value of witness evidence in arbitration, right? Um, by forbidding at the outset counsel and or the parties to contact the witnesses unless the parties consent, okay? Contra, poor witness preparation. Uh, the witness does not focus on the significant facts of the case. Uh, I'll give you a, a, another one. Um, so, it goes to Adolfo's point about witnesses lie. Well, the, as you, you know, the IBA, one, there are jurisdictions in which, in fact, that is testimony by employees is not permitted. Um, and uh, presumably because they're biased or, or whatever, but the point is, that's nothing. Well, the IBA rules took on that issue and, and in effect, it says that that's not a basis to disqualify someone from being uh, um, uh, testifying. One of the recommendations uh, that was made uh, in terms of by one of the task force members is discard the possibility permitted by the IBA rules, which allow employees to testify. Another response, complete contrast. There should be no restriction on the person of the witness. So again, you can see these slight conflicts, at which, which ultimately you'll see how, how they build up, but you know, you're seeing these different perspectives of witness evidence. Um, the other one that uh, was really one of the fundamental differences is the, the documentary evidence versus uh, witness evidence. Um, and, and so you, you, you think about the exact wording of some of these and, 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 and the, what is implicit in some of these statements, okay? So we're talking about witness evidence and how it should be treated. Here's one response. The emphasis is mine, where best evidence Paren, documentary evidence is available, the testimony of fact witness ought not be led. In other words, permitted, basically. So if we've got documentary evidence, we shouldn't allow fact witness evidence. Um, so think about the, the hierarchy that's being set up there. Um, then, you know, here's, um, uh, you know, in, in you know, just give you the contrast. So the best evidence is documentary evidence. We shouldn't have witnesses. Now, uh, there, this is one of the comments, you know, there are separate. There are some arbitrators that seem to have little confidence in fact witnesses without further evidence and, and from an arbitrator. It's difficult to base the award only on the witness statements in contradistinction to documentary evidence, right? So, arbitrator is saying, look, I mean, if all I have is people testifying before me, I really have a hard time, you know, basing an award. I, I really need documentary evidence, right? Um, and, and I'm giving you several of these uh, instances so you can see the depth and the variety of, of view, not the variety of view, but, but the, 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 the number of people that in fact, you know, uh, uh, would, would espouse or, or, or ascribe to this view. When is witness evidence diminishes in value when the witness testifies as to the contents of documentary evidence and the witness's testimony is contrary to the documentary evidence? This is not saying, you know, th that 
you know, it's one thing that look, if a witness testifies as to this and the uh, testimony is, you know, contrary to the document and so on, uh, you know, I, I would, in, in effect, it, it affects it and, and so on. Let, let me give you another example. Hold on for a second. Um, diminishes in value when it contradicts the documentary evidence. Um, if witness statements are not supported by any other evidence, addiction to documentary evidence and clearly in favor of the, the party witness. Um, give you a, another example. Um, it would enhance the probative value of witness evidence and arbitration of the parties use witness evidence only to fill in the gaps the, of, of documentary evidence. In other words, show me the documents and only if there's a gap somewhere do, do I want to hear from, from a witness. Um, see, I, yeah. The, the, the examples that I've given, um, you know, I've had cases uh, where uh, I've had a client, for example, that was doing a project with a government company uh, in a Latin American country um, and highly political pro uh, profile project. Uh, there were difficulties in the project and whatnot. Um, the government agency in effect writes our client uh, and says you know you're you're not performing and everything else and our client uh, because it is so politically charged you know says look I, I this isn't right but I'm not going to write back because this is just going to throw fuel on the fire it's just going to make it worse so I'm just going to kind of you know go along and, and so on and uh, in fact they weren't in breach it was you know basically the agency had written for political reasons and whatnot. Well, of course, two years later, we're now in the arbitration and the other side is, is saying, you know, we wrote you and, you know, you didn't object uh, and, and so on. And there is an instance where, uh, of course, you have the document and I'm not suggesting the document would not be valid uh, or, or have weight, but our client uh, would and did ultimately explain, well, yeah, but let me tell you why I didn't answer. Let me tell you the political pressures that were being exerted on us and why, and, and so on. And in that instance, you know, arbitrators, uh, it seemed to me would be very, uh, it would be very fair for them to say, well, I've got the documents, you know, normally people respond to things. And in this case, you didn't respond to things. Okay, but maybe there's a valid reason. Well, if you go back to some of these responses that, that you had uh, from, from folks, essentially it would be, almost automatic in that instance is listen I've got a letter here you didn't respond and it you know and 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 so on um you'll see how at, at the end uh one of the task force recommendations is uh look um we there should not be a hierarchy of evidence documents should not weigh more than witness testimony in each case you need to weigh all of the evidence and so on um the other one that, that I found very interesting is the um, the, the question of scope. Um, if you you see here that the question was, okay, the use of witness evidence, right? Should the witness evidence be more focused, more limited to disputed facts, or is it appropriate for witness evidence to go broader? And what some of the responses said is, in most cases in commercial arbitration, the context should be irrelevant for the legal analysis. Again, look, look at the context should be irrelevant for the legal analysis in most commercial uh, arbitration cases, right? Um, the, in contrast, you know, look at another arbitrator says, witness evidence is ultimately about good story. Disputed facts always require context. Uh, so there's a danger in attempting to respond the scope. So, you know, it's in for one arbitrator, context is should be irrelevant in most cases. In for another arbitrator, you know, disputed facts always require context. Uh, so you can see again these contrasting views. Um, I give you another one, uh, you know, in my in again talking about whether you limit it or not. Um, in, <clears throat> in in this arbitrator is saying, you know, in my view, it would be helpful to limit it. For all cases, again, look look at the uh, the, the the absolute you know uh, views uh, that are that are being uh, espoused. There is no case where I would like to see or hear evidence from a witness that is not relevant or material to the case and its outcome. Um, it's preferable, in our opinion, if fact witness evidence was more focused on or even limited to disputed facts that are relevant to to its outcome. In all cases. Um, 
so uh, perfect. And so again, one one big issue was the question of context and to what degree do you go through background and et cetera, as opposed to focusing, no, 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 I just want to know what happened at that meeting on April 12th. Um, and, and you can see the, the contrast. Related to this, of course, is the, the question of cross. And there, there was a, you know, a big, big disparity of views about the value of cross and tribunal questioning. You know, it's better to have the tribunal ask the questions versus having a counsel ask the questions. Um, and you know, here uh, again, these are conceptual differences um, where we're talking about the scope. And it says, you know, during the hearing, cross examination, sorry, cross questioning should focus on disputed facts and not on everything said in the witness statements, right? So here's one answer the arbitrator say, look, just tell me what the disputed facts is. And I don't want you to tell me about anything else in the witness statements, just focus on the disputed facts. Um, let me give you a contrast by another answer. You don't need to read this entire thing, but this is an answer from one of the task force members says, here's the red. When I cross-examine witness, uh, witnesses, I do not necessarily focus on disputed facts. Compare that, right? So we've got one arbitrator saying cross-examination should focus on disputed facts. Uh, the other, we've got an advocate who's saying, I do not necessarily focus on disputed facts and look at the last the red. He says, you know, undermining a witness's credibility in whole and part is one of the purposes of cross. Um, you know, this can be risky, blah, blah, blah. But one might undermine the credibility by looking at facts which are not central to the outcome of the case, uh, but which in fact, you know, winds up uh, undermining the, um, renders the evidence of that witness unreliable. So again, from, you know, think about from the standpoint of contrasting the, um, the, the, the different philosophies or, or views, you, you can see the, the, the contrast in those. Um, the, you know, another one here, and we'll wrap, be wrapping up. Um, one of the issues, again, dealing with, with cross-examination was that, um, you know, we, we, there was different views in terms of the role of the tribunal and so on. Um, and here you've got somebody saying, look, there, there are always witnesses who avoid questions. They don't actually answer. And this goes on for a long time with the arbitrators remaining passive. The tribunals could warn witnesses that they are not answering more often. Um, and uh, again, uh, written statements and direct questions should maintain such limits and counsel should advise witnesses to keep their answers to the questions on direct and especially on cross. And there was asking the tribunal to, to steer that. Um, on the other hand, contrast this. Okay, so you've got one that says, listen, arbitrators need to tell witnesses that they need to answer the question, listen to the question and answer it, right? Here's, here's another an a contrasting answer, right? We should avoid tight cross-examination, no, yes or no answers. Uh, we should let the witness speak freely, not only answer questions in cross. Um, asking in detail, not necessarily following, these are recommendations by this, these respondents, uh, asking in detail, not necessarily following written submissions by party counsel, avoiding any influence by party counsel during the interrogation, using all effort to create an atmosphere as, as comfortable for the witness as possible, um, and, and so on. So again, you know, just trying to go to, uh, you know, Adolfo's point that says, you know, there's, there's such a contrast for some people, you know, say all witnesses lie and so on. We'll think about how this applies. You can see this contrast here where somebody is saying, you know, one recommendation is we, we got to tighten cross-examination and, and keep witnesses to, to respond. The other one is saying, no, 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 this basically should be just an opportunity to converse with the witness. So you can see, you know, the, the frustration that you can wind up with if you have these contrasting uh, views in, in, in a hearing. Um, and just to wrap up, one of the things that we did uh, say is, you know, in broad terms, civil law jurisdictions have placed less focus on witness evidence and more focus on documentary evidence. In contrast, common law jurisdictions have placed significant focus on witness evidence, and uh, it is from those jurisdictions that the tr traditions of narrative witness statements and cross-examination of witnesses, you know, emerged. Um, and much of the discussion of the subject of witness evidence is influenced by preconceived notions over the value of witness evidence, the means to present it and to elicit it. In other words, this is from the report. Uh, and, and I thought it was is, is very, the way in which we dealt with those conflicts that we just showed you. 
uh, that I just showed you, um, because a lot of the discussion and the debate that took place within the task force was by these just sort of very different perspectives of the value of witness evidence, uh, the value of cross-examination, and, and so on. And so the, the bottom line in terms of this issue, what the task force expressly says is witness evidence can be valuable and important. The task force considers that a predetermined view of the hierarchy of the value of different types of evidence, such as that documents should be accorded more weight than testimony, is neither justified nor prudent. Uh, to me, that's one of the most important takeaways uh, from the, the task force report. Um, Adolfo, that's that's you know that's basically you know the the gist. I'm happy to you know answer any questions that might be out there, and you know as time permits, but you you tell me. Um, yes. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, I think the best way might be to through the chat function. Um, we actually do have one point, but but before turning to to the chat, I, you touched on something, Jose, which is um, th there was some discussion of arbitral tribunals at doing the questioning. I've seen a lot of variety in tribunals. Some tribunals are get, um, you know, very involved and ask all, you know, all the witnesses some questions, other tribunals barely ever raise a question. I've also seen where witnesses and the way they uh, respond tends to vary a great deal. Uh, a lot of times you get witnesses who have been prepared and they're very uh, on script. They go through cross-examination and they're very defensive and on guard. And then the arbitrator will, an arbitrator will ask a question and they relax and they seem to speak Absolutely. More, more on a conversational standpoint. Was that dynamic discussed in, in, by the task force at all? And what, what's your thinking? Sure. Um, the, the particular... The answer is yes, but but perhaps I, I, but let me put it in context. Um, the because the, the the issue of um, questioning is something that happened in a what I'll call a purely common law international arbitration, right? So, but you know, it's preceded by you know first the presentation of the witness very briefly on, on direct, then the cross examination, and then typically the tribunal. Yes, I may interrupt. Wait, wait a minute, I didn't understand that. But typically, a tribunal does not do an extensive questioning in the middle of somebody's cross. The the discussion that took place within the task force was not about that modality, uh, which is well, how far should a I'm going to call it a common law international arbitration, go in, in asking questions and so on, as opposed to saying, no, 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 no. The tribunal is going to ask the questions. And then after the tribunal gets done, the council can ask, I'll call it cleanup questions. Um, and uh, that was, you know, in fact, the, the, the discussion and, and that's where you know you had the views of look we need to have this basically be, be a conversation make a witness more relaxed and uh, there is in fact a, a, of course a, a human phenomenon that uh, again witnesses will often understand that the opposing counsel is not there to be their friend but to do a job and so on and they may tend to have more of the defensive systems up but that if the tribunal you know is again they, they will tend to be less defensive and sort of more uh, responsive, if you would, to, to the tribunal questions. But to me, the, 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 the really the, 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 the deeper issue is the question of whether or not to have the tribunal driven uh, inquiry it, to begin with. Um, and, you know, the, there's school for thought, obviously, you know, the Prague rules uh, sort of went along the, the, in that direction, uh, if you would. Interesting. Um, Eduardo Bandal from uh, Portugal has a question. I'm not sure I understand it, but uh, he writes, uh, uh, Dr. Jose Artigaraga, I would like to hear about memory accidents, in quotes, as deja vu and other situations. Um, so, so uh, sure. Um, you know, in fact, a lot of it, it's, it's an interesting choice, you know, of, of word. I, th I think it's, it's a very good one because in, in all of the examples that I, that I sort of gave at the, at the beginning, I mean, that's really what is happening, right? In other words, the, 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 the memory is committing an error in trying to recall one of the, um, in terms of post-event information, one of the, the, the most uh, glaring examples, if you would, is that, you know, President Bush is said to have act, President George 
W. Bush uh, is said to at one point have said, uh, yes, I remember the airplane crashing into the World Trade Center. And in fact, that, that wasn't the case. You know, he just hadn't seen it, but what had happened because he had been besieged with information after the um, 9-11, you know, the memory just becomes jumbled. And then, you know, you think that you've seen, seen things. So I'll call that an, an accident of, uh, of memory. Um, there, are, there are aspects of this, you, know, you mentioned deja vu. We did not deal with deja vu in the context of, of the, um, the, the scientific evidence that was, uh, was presented. But I, I think it's very much related to the, the type of mental, you know, skip, if you would, that occurs at times uh, when uh, witnesses are being asked about their recollection. We're at uh, the one hour mark. I, I want to say before we, we break how important this is, the, the, there is such divergence between different countries, different you know, legal systems, different cultures as to what weight you're going to give to testimony, what weight you're going to give to documentary evidence. Um, you know, the, the, the Napoleonic code system versus a common law system and how they look at uh, legal issues and factual issues and, and come to a decision, it's just very, very different. And so um, having this kind of discussion as to witness testimony, it just, it, it, it's so necessary because so often you just see, you know, two different uh, views on exactly the same thing. Um, you know, the importance of testing credibility, for example, it's just in some cases, as you pointed out, it's, it's, uh, it's important in other, uh, you know, for some other jurists, it doesn't matter at all. So the, the report, if you want to find it, it's uh, if you Google the accuracy of fact witness memory in international arbitration, uh, it's available. It's a, a you know, fascinating report with a lot of uh, uh, diligence and uh, information. So I, I urge you to get it. We'll try and post it on mias.org so it's available to you. Um, and I just want to congratulate and thank Jose because this goes a long way to uh, helping all international arbitration practitioners to get a better handle or understanding um, on something where there's just so so you know such a spectrum uh, that it, it's hard to you know look at evidence and make sure that you're you're fully appreciating what weight you should give it and understanding how maybe your colleague or your co-arbitrator is handling that matter. This is a very, very valuable. And I thank you so much for presenting this to Mias.org. And thank you to all the guests who are here. We've had people from Argentina, from Portugal, a lot, you know, really all over the world. And it's great to be able to present to everybody. Before we break, um, there's, there's one question from Hector Fernandez. He asks, if I know that the witness is lying in a cross-examination, how should I react as cross-examining counsel? Um, well, uh, Hector, since, um, I, I, since it, it doesn't deal with memory, I'm actually going to lateral that ball to Adolfo, who <laughs> I can tell you is an expert at cross-examination. <laughs> you destroy their credibility. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's a, because um, if, if somebody is, is completely misrepresenting what they're saying, it, it's, it's sometimes they're, they're waiting for you to attack them on the main points, but oftentimes they're misrepresenting a lot of different issues. And I think you, you, you try and come up with a long list of points that where they're misrepresenting things. I, I remember being in an arbitration where the expert witness was saying one thing, but then we went into their bio and they had a case description that captured this very same case where they were saying that their scope of work was completely different from what they were testifying to and included in their witness statement. And so that was a way of um, attacking them and then going into the other areas. Um, I, 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 for one, you know, Jose described that. I, for one, believe, you know, testing somebody's credibility is, is important. Not in all cases, sometimes it can really backfire on you, but, but anyway, I, <laughs> we should probably uh, end it there and, Thank you all for your participation and, and uh, being part of MIAS. It, it's very important. Jose, thank you for, for thank this. Thank you, All you've done to you know, place Miami as a center of international arbitration. Take thank care. you so much, Adolfo.
Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.